Welcome to this slightly delayed um, event. I'm sorry for all the drama that appeared to have taken place in the previous room we were meant to be in, and the fact that there's now been a little bit of confusion as to where we are, but nevertheless, here we are. Um, welcome to all of you. My name is Lena Wendland. I work in the UN Human Rights Office. I oversee our work on business and human rights and have also been um, very closely involved in the efforts uh, in the sports and human rights agenda, particularly um, uh, aimed at embedding the UN guiding principles and other UN standards into the world of sport. So this is the first high-level dialogue. Um, it's part of the UN Human Rights Office uh, celebration campaign to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the, United, uh, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Celebrate is the word um, we're doing. We're celebrating this amazing document um, and we're using the anniversary to leverage um, uh, for good effect in terms of visibility, thought leadership, uh, and influence of new audiences, and, um, and having these kinds of high-level dialogues with the High Commissioner and other global leaders. So, um, as I mentioned, this is the first in the series. There will be others, um, including one featuring the president of the international um, uh, of the ICJ, um, uh, and also one with a noted lawyer and jurist, Mr. Ben Ferenc. So I would like to, I'm not sure our two thought leaders here needs a lot of introduction, um, but I will start by just uh, welcoming and introducing uh, President Buck, um, Thomas Buck, who has been president of the IOC since 2013 and um, holds a doctorate in law, but uh, perhaps for today's purposes, um, he also holds a very impressive record as a competitive athlete and was an Olympic team foil fencer. And I must confess, I had to look up exactly what that meant, but I, I gather that it's the type of weapon that is used. So um, President Buck um, won um, the Olympic team gold medal in 1976 and was also um, on the world champion uh, team winning uh, goals silver and bronze medals um, in 1973, 1977, and 1979. So welcome very much, uh, uh, President Buck, to this um, conversation, which um, we look forward to hearing your insights. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, my boss, until um, September at least, um, the High Commissioner assumed uh, office in 2014. I'm not sure he needs a lot of introduction in this room, but he was, of course, the former ambassador of Jordan. And um, our website, uh, his bio, he is described as a veteran multilateral diplomat. Um, and I think that covers a very long um, list of, of speeches. I also noted that he holds a um, doctorate of philosophy, which makes a lot of sense, actually, um, now that I know that, um, just in terms of how you have approached the office and, um, and engaged on the issues in your time um, as High Commissioner. So the aim of today's event is um, to reflect on the interface between sport and human rights and on how we can ensure both that human rights are respected in sport but also how it's realized through sport. It's an issue that the Human Rights Council um, is increasingly taking up through various resolutions. We also have this year's uh, social forum in October focused on this interface. So it's a very uh, topical issue. It's a growing agenda um, also at the international level. So just um, a few sort of uh, rules of the game very quickly. So it's, as I mentioned, celebration of UDHR 70th. Um, we are seeking to create an atmosphere that is informal and personal. So this is not about um, giving formal statements or official uh, positioning. This really is, um, we're seeking and inviting personal reflections from, from these two thought leaders. And, and the seating, yes, and I mean all evidence to the contrary, but let's just try to overcome that um, those obstacles and um, and 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 try to realise at least that part of the um, part of the aim. So a conversation, personal reflections. Um, we will have uh, time for some Q and A in the at the end, and we are hoping that um, the Q and A will be conducted in the similar spirit. So very much personal reflections. Um, and suggestions rather than um, uh, formal statements. So we're seeking to cover broadly um, very, three broad segments, the interface between sport and human rights as expressed both in the Olympic Charter and the UDHR, 
and the opportunities to realize uh, human rights through sport, but importantly as well, how to um, ensure, prevent and mitigate risks um, related to sport. I will try to moderate, and for those of you in the room that are government delegates will know that moderating the High Commissioner in particular might um, can be a challenging exercise, but I will um, try to do my best um, to steer the conversation, but I'm confident that we will cover um, broadly these... Um, yeah, no, I can say this now. <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, to kick off, um, we'll start by, indeed, some personal reflections. Um, what sport means to you um, as individuals? Um, what qualities has it brought to your lives? What can sport teach us about life? And I will start by you, um, with you, President Buck, um, growing up involved in sport as you did. W rules, fairness, how did it impact you as a person? And how do you take that into um, to a discussion like the one we have today? Uh, how long time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll just wave the flag. Uh, when, uh, <laughs> now, if, uh, I think if, if I would have to, to sum this up, uh, there in the end would be, uh, would be one word, it would be respect. Uh, it would be uh, a respect for others, it would be uh, a respect uh, for rules, it would be respect for yourself and your limits, also to, to respect your, your, your limits. And uh, by uh, uh, saying, you know, respect uh, for others, to uh, to get to learn uh, how to deal with victory in defeat. Mm. Mm. So to, to know that, uh, that the victory does not make you superior mm. to, uh, to, to somebody else. Mm. And that on the other hand, the defeat is not uh, the, the end of, uh, of everything. Uh, but uh, that it can just be a, a, a new beginning and that uh, you can maybe learn from a defeat more than from a, from a victory. Uh, and uh, then respect for rules, uh, this also means uh, that, first of all, it's key to the functioning of sport. And, and this is what makes, uh, what makes a sport uh, unique. It's, it's the, the the only area of our of our life uh, where we have uh, a world law or how the philosophers uh, philosophers uh, would would say a uh, world ethos mm. and where everybody needs to respect this and where you can uh, really enforce it mm. uh, also uh, 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 worldwide so it's not just a shallow mm. uh, framework but it's something uh, you can uh, uh, you, you you can enforce, and uh, that there you you learn that uh, uh, a society, be it uh, just your very small environment, uh, be it your club, uh, be it uh, society at large, can only work if uh, there is a respect uh, for for these rules, for 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 this law. So. In the end, it's, uh, it's respect, and uh, if you ask uh, then for the real feelings, it's joy, mm. uh, because uh, sport uh, gives, uh, gives joy. Mm. Uh, and uh, there we even have in the, in the Olympic Charter uh, a wording which speaks about the joy in effort. Mm. Uh, I admit that this has been written by a German <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, there is indeed a, a joy in, in, in effort. Thank you very much. Um, High Commissioner, I didn't, I didn't see on your CV that you had been a professional athlete exactly, <laughs> but I know that you do enjoy sport, and I'm, I, I imagine that a lot of what the President was saying around uh, respect for rules, enforcement of laws, etc., does resonate a lot um, also in your professional capacity, but your personal perspective to start. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lena. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I did notice that you didn't mention anything of my sporting prowess when I was young. Uh, 
And uh, I think, well, I think uh, the president's absolutely right. It's one of the key pillars of education. As you grow up, you're educated in your home, you follow example. And uh, one of the earliest memories many of us will have is you know, playing in a playground or in the backyard of someone's home, kicking a ball. And uh, it's one of those central building blocks of one's personality, one's character, understanding, as, as the president was saying, that you have to operate in a, in a uh, system of rules. And, uh, and very soon, you know, the rules have to also be uh, applied. And the very ethic of uh, the training required, the practices you have to turn up at, uh, and one always remembers, no matter where one's growing up, whereas uh, often the, the weather would be terrible and you are cold or raining or snowy or, or hot and humid and you were practicing. And, and it was all part of, of growing up and understanding how fundamental sport is to a dignified life. Um, but to build on, on the president's uh, point, um, I was not a fencer. Uh, and and uh, it's a sport, though, that I've always um, admired. And I have two children who are, were competitive fencers. They have to be brought back in. They've strayed a little bit from the path. And they were uh, competitive in foil as well. And there was one very intense competition uh, where oops, there was one very intense competition where there was so much noise and my son was fencing against a younger fencer uh, in an auditorium where there was so much noise between the points and an enormous amount of shouting from the coaches during the breaks and and, um, and the family's also very much engaged and intense. And, uh, and my, my son beat this uh, other competitor convincingly. In actual fact, it was at the end, he almost uh, he destroyed him. And what was so extraordinary is that this little boy, after they finished saluting and they went up to shake hands, he really looked into my son's face and said, you really did well and congratulations, and he meant it. And I thought to myself, in this hall with a few hundred people, many adults, um, many trainers and the coaches and the teams, and, uh, that the, this graciousness shown by this young boy made him the most dignified human being in that hall that day, that there was something elevated about it. And then it sort of raises this other question of, Yes, the literal benefits of sport to all of us, how it fulfills a, a sort of a, a deep-seated need, but then the representation of life, what, what it means for us is a representation of life, and it's, it's drawing by uh, analogy. Um, I, I, one of the examples I use, and uh, I'm often reminded by uh, those who've heard me say it before, um, I used to play the game of rugby a great deal. And what struck out, what was obvious to me from the very beginning, is you could be a winning team dependent on a small number of really excellent players. That to win or to score, you didn't need to have an outstanding 15. You could have an outstanding seven or eight and they'll carry the rest of us. But to defend when you're absolutely on your line then everyone had to show excellence. Everyone had to play their part. And in life, I think it's the same. I think when we're finding that we're struggling for the existence of a thought, a principle, an idea, that we all have to play a part in defending it. And I think in the human rights context, that's clearly where we are now in this space. And so sport teaches one a great deal beyond the mental and, and physical energies that need to be expired to succeed in a particular event. And I think your point also about how one copes with loss, uh, the loss of a game, the loss of a, a particular race, the, uh, and the internalizing that must take place and the value of society on that and how we view ourselves vis-a-vis -vis society and why we 
should or should not attach an external marker. And I, the, the very notion within the Olympic ideal that it's the participation above all which is the key thing, irrespective of the nationality and you know, all the other markers that define us as human beings, I think is just something that is really at the core of what makes us human and why it has to be so, so uh, celebrated and celebrated time and again. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, delighted to have this conversation, even though you know, I'm, I'm not a sportsman of, uh, of President Bach's caliber. Although maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not bad at table tennis. I need to try to find a sport that I can challenge you in at, at some stage. If I, if I would have known this, I would have invited <laughs> you to, to uh, our Olympic Day celebration last Friday. Uh, there I, I was playing uh, table tennis uh, with, uh, <laughs> with the North and South Korean table tennis players and the Japanese and the Chinese. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you would have made a <laughs> really added value yeah, there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, the other, the other thing then is that, you know, it connects everyone with their youth. Um, it's, it's something that you try and do throughout your life. You try and stay connected to some physical activity, some mental activity, but... For most people, it's a connection to a youth and memory that is meaningful and deep in shaping who it is that we are. And I, I think that's really a wonderful, wonderful thing because it's never too far away. And I had the similar experience once where I was at a retreat on Security Council reform. And there were four ambassadors who were engaged in intense discussions. And we saw a table tennis table. so we. We said, let's take a break, and, and we went and started to play. And it was amazing. In the beginning, we were all laughing and joking, and, and then the, lo the laughs and the jokes <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> so <laughs> we, who won? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> not Peter Maurer. Who <laughs> so I've outed him, and uh, he, was, he was part of it. But I think it's the sort of the enjoyment and the fact that it connects us to a past as well, and a formative past for, for everyone, which is so important. And then, um, and I guess as we're seeing these days, bringing people together, you can't walk anywhere in Geneva at the moment without running into a big screen and people standing around and watching and being uh, coming together in a in a in a in a way, even if only for for the 15 minutes um, as they are passing the road, but also um, in their homes. So it's this notion of of, of convening, of bringing uh, people together. But if we link it, then a little bit more directly to the notions, the found foundational values of human rights. We've heard the word dignity, respect, uh, fairness, um, rules of the game, enforcement. And so that really, I guess, is where those worlds are, are very well matched, for lack of a better word. Um, and, and High Commissioner, if you want to just uh, take a couple of minutes to reflect a little bit more deeply on the UDHR and how the, the kinds of, 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 of values that you've both been talking about, how they are expressed and what, what value comes from having them expressed in a document like the Universal Declaration. And I, I think the, the key word, of course, is universal. And that applies to the, you know, both of the, the organizations or the organization and our office. And, and it's brought out uh, in the preamble of the Universal Declaration, uh, actually in the first article, that all people are born free in, dig in dignity and rights. And, uh, and subsequent to that, in the 30 articles that follow, about a third link directly in some way or another to sport. And it's the notion that that you are judged on the excellence of your activity, on the effort that you put into a particular activity where the rules are defined and, the, and there is fairness that is brought out. And you are not judged on any other criteria than that. So uh, on all the criteria that are enumerated uh, in the various legal instruments uh, as a, a means of, of preventing discrimination, uh, in sport, that should not and does not come into being. And we celebrate, and I think we were discussing this beforehand, when watching an Olympic event, we celebrate outstanding performance. All the other criteria that attach to it, of the nationality of the individual, the particular color, the religion, the race, the, 
the ethnicity, whatever the criteria may be, is second or actually almost irrelevant to the performance itself. It's the, it's the beauty, the grace, the, the power of the performance, which I think all of us celebrate as human beings, that there's some amazing people on this planet. And, um, and I think this is the sort of the, this is what binds us as a human race. Uh, and we have to be careful that, that in our celebrations, that we don't become, as we were saying earlier, that we don't cross the line and you know, become chauvinistic nationalists where, where you wish uh, you know, for the sake of victory, you know, the destruction of someone else's future, their life, and so forth. And that's why I think it's, it's so important that we maintain the universal spirit that both is evoked within the IOC and uh, what we're trying to do. Um, but uh, clearly there is, and we'll get into some of the detail now in a few minutes, I mean, there are more specific things that we need to pay attention to. Um, but I, I, you know, the, the overlap is, is really quite astonishing. And so I, I'm delighted to be sharing the podium with President Buck today. President Buck, um, if you can pick up from there, and I mean, it's often said that the Olympic movement, it's a values-based organization. You have some of these fundamental values um, expressed in your charter. So if you can, um, can continue some of those reflections uh, from, from the perspective of the Olympic charter. Well, I, could, uh, I could make my life very easy and just say I have nothing to add. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and I'm only happy that uh, we don't have uh, IOC presidential elections this October. <laughs> uh, uh, well, because I have to be a gold medalist. No? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> because uh, the High Commissioner really uh, uh, summed it up in a, in a, in a perfect way. Uh, it's about universality and it's about non-discrimination and uh, therefore uh, in, 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 in sport and there I can make reference to what I said before that this uh, world law of sports yeah. and because of this uh, world law of sports uh, we are in fact we are all equal yeah. Yeah. Uh, there on the on the yeah. field of play yeah. you're alone yeah. and you're equal yeah. mm? Uh, yeah. to, 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 to all the others. Yeah. And uh, then with regard to universality, uh, there uh, the, the, the Olympic Games you know, have, a, have a special meaning uh, because uh, in, in the Olympic Games you have in fact all 206 National Olympic Committees participating. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have uh, the whole world together at one place, at one time. Mm -hmm. It's almost like in the rules of the old Greek drama. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, 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 in addition, and this is maybe the most uh, uh, yeah, valuable message and, uh, and experience uh, also for, for, any, for any Olympic athletes, you, don't, you do not have them only together mm -hmm. there at one place. They are living together in one Olympic village. Mm. So uh, mm. they share their meals, mm. they get to know each other, they mm. share their emotions, mm. and uh, then the next day they are going to compete against each other. Mm. And then they are coming back uh, from, from competition and then they meet mm. each other again mm. uh, and uh, continue uh, their uh, discussion. Uh, maybe understand each other even better than uh, uh, than before. Mm. So it's this kind of of universal character, mm. uh, which what, what uh, makes and the Olympic Village, mm. what makes the Olympic Games so unique. Mm. This uh, you don't have uh, anywhere else. Mm. And uh, uh, to 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 demonstrate, you know that. Uh, uh, this is so important for us, mm. for our mission, for our values. Mm. Uh, we have even made it obligatory for all national Olympic committees to participate in the games. Mm. Uh, mm. So uh, that uh, you know, any kind of uh, uh, of non-appearance, mm. let's say, for for uh, reasons of discrimination, mm. be it political. Mm. Uh, be it racial, be it religious, uh, whatsoever, 
uh, would be an infringement of the Olympic uh, uh, Charter and then uh, uh, could and would be, would yeah. be sanctioned. Yeah. So uh, there to show that to make this, uh, this uh, little universe uh, functioning, yeah. everybody has to make its yeah. contribution. And yeah. if uh, one is missing, yeah. it is already against, uh, against our values, against the spirit, against our against our mission I understand also you like to stay there during the games or is that, didn't you say that you like to spend as much time in the village in the village yeah now, yeah. now if you, you know, if you meet uh, and uh, if I meet fellow Olympians I mm. will not repeat the year you gave for that <laughs> because this was not so charming <laughs> right? but all the rest was correct but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, when, when, whenever, whenever uh, the fellow Olympians uh, meet among themselves uh, and then start to exchange memories mm. uh, it doesn't last two minutes yeah. until they speak about the experience in the village yeah because there is the world yeah. in one place. Yeah. In yeah. one cafeteria, yeah. you see the, the whole world uh, uh, together. And, and there, uh, you know, you, uh, you should have seen maybe the, the, the reaction of uh, uh, the athletes from, from these 206 National Olympic Committees to uh, the refugee Olympic team, which mm -hmm. we created for the first time uh, in uh, in Rio uh, 2016, mm. and there, uh, how there, mm. the, the the power of sport mm. for inclusion, mm. uh, what was obvious, uh, you know, they they were uh, uh, like pop stars mm. among the other athletes. All mm. the other athletes, uh, you know, they may have won uh, five gold medals or participated in four games. Uh, they 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 went there. They they wanted. Uh, to show them you're you're part of us, mm. you're on the equal basis. You're mm. not a, you're not a refugee. Mm. You're an athlete mm. uh, here, mm. and as athlete, we are all uh, we are all uh, uh, equal. So th these are these uh, e experiences uh, which you can only make mm. in an uh, in an Olympic village, and uh, this is why uh, I. Uh, um, I always ask uh, the, the organizing committees to, to reserve a, a, a room uh, for me in the village uh, so uh, that I can stay there. But I, I have to admit uh, it, it doesn't work the way I, I wanted it to work. Uh, it's uh, maybe uh, one or two nights uh, where, I can, uh, where I can then can manage. But uh, then uh, being there uh, and... Uh, going to the breakfast uh, uh, and uh, they're sitting uh, then uh, with the athletes uh, discussing in an, in an open way. Uh, th th this is uh, what uh, the Olympic idea is about. Could I ask a question? Sure. So, without dwelling on how, um, how young you are, um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's already a good start no, 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 for a tricky I'm question. My, I'm beginning my campaign. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, when you were competing, uh, Thomas, it was the, still the Cold War. The world was very much still divided ideologically, and, and your country was divided uh, you know, along those lines. Was it still clear that ath athletes from East and West would would mix and talk and I mean, was it? Did it feel like a safe space in that se in, the, in those years during the the time of the Cold War? Was it uh, was it more open than anywhere else that you'd have perhaps? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the Cold War and all its effects on sports mm -hmm. is the reason why I'm sitting here today. Yeah. Uh, because uh, uh, I was uh, there, the, the, the speaker of uh, the, the, the German athletes yeah. uh, around uh, the discussion of uh, the boycott of the Moscow Games. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there, uh, despite uh, fighting hard, and there we are coming back uh, to, to the lessons being learned in, uh, in, in, in sport, 
despite fighting hard against uh, this uh, boycott for the reasons we discussed, mm. uh, we lost. Mm. And uh, we had to boycott mm. uh, then, uh, uh, then the games. Uh, something where all the politicians who mm. then were calling for it mm. after some years mm. at the latest, that they said it was a mistake. Mm. But this was too late for us. And this so, was so you could have won more gold medals, basically. Um, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this was uh, the moment. Uh, then after this, then the then president of the National Olympic Committee he came uh, to see me and said, mm. you know, could you imagine also to work on the management side of, mm. of, of a sport and there in the National Olympic Committee? Mm. And there where I said, uh, yes. And he said, don't you want to think about and I said, no. And he said, why? And I said, because I do not want uh, to happen what happened to us, yeah. to future generations of athletes, athletes yeah. and, and yeah. to sport. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there, you know, uh, the, we, we, we had already a feeling for, for these powers. But as an athlete, yeah. you, you, you don't think, uh, I, you know, yeah. I, when I was competing for the first time in the games, I had no idea what the, the, the IOC is or what the, the, they would do. Or uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, The only important thing was uh, it, it functions and you can get enough to eat and you can train and you can <laughs> compete. This is it. But uh, then you, you could feel this power of sport exactly yeah. Yeah. in this context uh, you are you're referring yeah. to because uh, they're even, you know, uh, they're the teams of, uh, let's mm. say, uh, the East Germany, GDR mm. at, uh, at the time, or, or USSR at the time. Uh, there were secret service people uh, mm. with them. But we always uh, nice. found a way uh, mm. to, to meet under the shower and uh, <laughs> uh, there to trade uh, then uh, uh, some goods uh, uh, there or, or, or to, to discuss or... Uh, to uh, to disappear yeah. there uh, uh, somewhere in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a break uh, to 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 be in, uh, in 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 contact and even if it was only at a at a handshake uh, where you would whisper something into somebody's ear uh, so uh, we we had this feeling of a of a sports and athletes a a community solid, a solidarity of between uh, 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 athletes, despite yeah. all these uh, political uh, uh, these political circumstances and yeah. problems can i just um segue from that i mean the sort of politicization of sport um is obviously one issue but um i see a number of the people in the room engaged in the the mega sporting event platform the center for human rights the concerns that already also your organization the ioc has 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 taken up in terms of um, making efforts to prevent and mitigate the, the sort of darker underbelly of sport. We've now heard, um, I think, very, very powerful testimony as to what is the power of sport, also when it comes to human rights, realizing sport both um, in the competition amongst um, uh, individuals, uh, players, athletes, um, and, and between communities. But there is this growing realization that, um, that, that all these positive contributions notwithstanding, there can be um, quite uh, significant levels of risk to human rights. Um, uh, so, so not wanting to stop realizing all the the positive contributions, but making sure that that the risks don't get in the way of realizing um, that full potential. So, I'll uh, maybe um, ask the High Commissioner the approaches to prevent and mitigate human rights risks in sport. You've been very supportive of of the UN Human Rights Office engaging in, in some of these discussions focused around the UN guiding principles embedding into sport the organization of sport and the life cycle of sport, but also through our work on non-discrimination, anti-discrimination um, efforts, for example, that has gone into organizing the, the FIFA World Cup in, in Russia. Yeah. So if, if you want to reflect a little bit on, on how that is the sort of other leg of the, of the, uh, uh, the work that, that we also need to be cognizant of and, and the power of collective action. Yeah, no, it, and it's a natural question that sort of comes following what I think in particular uh, President Buck has, has said, because 
if you take the overall emotional experience connected to sport, the intensity of the joy, uh, the sadness when you're, you know, a particular team loses or you may not do so well, and then how one resolves to gather strength from it, um, and the intensity of it means that there are always going to be attempts perhaps to subvert, to undermine, to cut corners. And for that reason, of course, you have the IOC, it's, uh, it's infrastructure. And, um, and the enjoyment of sport is, uh, is something that all of us uh, believe it is something so fundamental to human existence. So when it comes to you know, issues related to, as we've seen in, in other contexts, but you know, the creation of sports facilities, that, that uh, the, the approach to construction, the approach to the issue of uh, how one deals with labor rights and all of that, and it's well developed in, in other uh, sporting fora, that this, that this is done in a way that's transparent, that's open, and uh, that the enjoyment of sport, the participation of the athletes, is done without uh, it being at the expense of others who who, uh, whose experience is less than that. And I think uh, the commitments both by the IOC and ourselves and, and others to ensure that we don't have that and we encourage that all will abide by the guiding principles that if their company is associated with particular contracts that they have uh, clear or, and clean supply chains, global supply chains, that the, 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 uh, they take mitigating uh, measures uh, ensure that there is uh, human rights due diligence being applied, uh, look at the impact, the social and environmental impacts, uh, human rights impacts of any particular project. And I think the more, the more sensitive they are, uh, the more we can, if the, you know, where there are uh, fears, the more we can iron them out and, um, and have a con you know, future where mega sporting events uh, and um, and ourselves, we're working cohesively as one community, trying to promote a, a human activity, which is at the core of what it means to be human. And I think if we can if we can do that, then we're we're uh, we're doing very well. I mean, one should also th say that sport is really no different from any other critical human activity, because in other parts of life we s face similar pressures that with excellence comes attempts to cut corners here or there in, in any activity. Um, and, so, and so we, I wish I could only, I wish I could say that the human species is reliable enough not to require laws, not to require regulations, that we just on reason alone would do the right thing. Um, we're not there yet. We need laws, we need human rights laws, we need regulations, we need oversight, we need transparency. And, and uh, maybe in the future, our, our successors as humans will get to that stage. Um, but at the moment, that's where we are. And so a good conscience approach to that, to iron out discrimination and any violations that may creep into you know, sporting events, which would uh, generally tends to spoil, you know, spoil the activity. And, uh, and we've seen in certain sporting domains and you know, one remembers what uh, the cycling world had to go through with Lance Armstrong and, and the discovery of, of uh, what he was up to and how, um, what effect it had on young athletes and people who looked up to, be, you know, to champions as holding up an ideal and then it comes crashing down. And in all sports uh, where there is an attempt to, to succeed but fraudulently, you hope that you know, their regulatory framework and the transparency is such that it roots it out. And it goes back to your point about fairness and having a level playing field. And, and that's, I think, the point that we want to make. The guiding principles on business and human rights have a very expri uh, explicit um, uh, statement that there are no offsets in human rights. So doing good in one uh, sense doesn't... Um, uh, offset yeah. um, harm and and I guess um, for the IOC who have contributed very actively in the the platform for mega sporting event and human rights contributed to that but you've also taken steps I know that in the bidding criteria for the for upcoming games to 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 embed some of these um, 
human rights standards in the documents that you are working with to ensure that these games are organized in a way that, that take it account for and mitigate the risks and asks those who are in, uh, involved with, with hosting um, games to, to take steps. So um, if you would like, um, President Buck, before we, we turn over to, to questions from the audience to reflect on... on the kinds of activities and, and, and engagement that you've had uh, to also manage that side of, of the work of the organization. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I just with one sentence, uh, you know, uh, try to continue the thought of uh, the High Commissioner? Uh, because uh, I'm afraid that in this one point, mm. I'm a little bit less optimistic. Usually I'm a great optimist. Mm -hmm. But in, in this one point you made, I'm, I may be a, a little bit less optimistic about uh, the, the future of humankind mm -hmm. and uh, that, uh, that our successors as human beings uh, will one day... Uh, not really, not uh, need rules. And not need rules <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and live the, the, the values. Uh, yeah. Uh, there, I'm. I'm a little bit. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, skeptical uh, because uh, I think uh, humankind has has uh, has tried uh, for uh, thousands of years, yeah. and uh, we have laws th since thousands of years, and still uh, we need we need laws. We need police. Uh, uh, we we have to realize uh, that, uh, and they're uh, taking your. Uh, uh, your uh, doping example and, 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 and Lance Armstrong and others, that uh, uh, obviously when, uh, when uh, human beings uh, are competing with each other, mm. that uh, you will yeah. always have some okay. who try to cheat. Yeah. Uh, whether this is in business mm -hmm. mm? Yeah. Uh, or whether it is in in uh, in, 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 in in sport, yeah. mm? uh, yeah. uh, so uh, and we have yeah we have to to address this. Yeah. We have to realize uh, this that uh, uh, we always will have to defend our values that most likely there will not be the day where we can say today we have uh, uh, we have accomplished our mission our values are are, are, well are realized yeah. i guess this is an ongoing an, an ongoing effort and this leads me then to uh, to the responsibility of uh, uh, organizations uh, like uh, like ours um, where is they're our responsibility, and what mm. can we do? Mm. Uh, there, uh, our responsibility, I think, is is uh, is uh, very clear: is uh, uh, to ensure that the Olympic Charter, which includes human rights, mm. uh, is respected uh, during the Olympic Games uh, and uh, in all our own actions for which we are uh, uh, responsible. And there we have, uh, we have to create uh, the, the, the right instruments. Mm. I have made reference uh, to, uh, to some of these uh, before, because again, first mission is, uh, mm. is the, to ensure the universality, mm. to ensure dialogue, mm. to ensure respect uh, for each other, and in this way, contribute uh, to uh, one of the basic uh, human rights, uh, try to contribute to peace. Uh, what uh, the one or the other of you may have seen now, what this means uh, during the past uh, Olympic Winter Games with regard to, to North and, and South Korea, yeah. and now the, the, the ongoing uh, uh, efforts. There are more pragmatic issues you have mentioned that this is the host city contract mm. uh, where uh, we are already in the candidature phase and when we are evaluating candidatures mm. are taking uh, the advice uh, uh, there on, uh, on, on, on board 
sometimes coming from the High Commissioner himself uh, during a breakfast uh, in, uh, in, in, in Lausanne or at other uh, occasions, or from uh, human rights uh, organizations or uh, 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 governments. Uh, so to make this already part of, uh, the, uh, of the evaluation. And then it continues in the host city uh, uh, contract uh, where uh, for, for the games uh, we uh, make uh, there certain standards, including uh, the, the ones on uh, business, obligatory. But on the other hand, we have to respect that there our authority ends. Uh, uh, you know, we, uh, politics cannot expect from us then uh, to change or to solve issues uh, what politics has not solved over, over centuries. Mm. Uh, uh, so uh, to, to, to give you an example, to make it more concrete, uh, we had uh, uh, problems uh, with regard to uh, non-discrimination uh, before the Olympic Winter Games in Sochi at the time because uh, there was a legislation which uh, prohibits mm. uh, uh, the promotion of homosexuality mm. uh, in Russia. Mm. So we had, we had this law and uh, we had uh, our responsibility mm. to ensure non-discrimination for all the participants of the games. Yeah. So what did we do and what could we do? We were speaking with, uh, uh, with uh, the, the Russian government mm. and got the assurance mm. that this law would not apply to any participant of the Olympic Games. Mm. And this is how it happened. Mm. Mm. But uh, you cannot expect mm. Uh, mm. From, from the IOC mm. then uh, to try to impose on a sovereign state mm. uh, the change of its le legislation. Mm. Mm. Uh, the same applies to uh, you. You could, uh, you know, it's a uh, death penalty or or, or, or whatever. Mm. Uh, uh, there, uh, there is our responsibility, and this responsibility we are taking uh, very serious uh, with regard to uh, to different uh, uh, actions uh, we have. Uh, they're an own, uh, a part of an own uh, even a leader mm. in, in, in another platform uh, called IPEX, uh, mm. which uh, mm. concerns uh, questions of uh, good governance and anti-corruption, which sometimes overlaps mm. uh, there with, uh, with uh, human rights issues, uh, where we are working uh, uh, from Interpol to UNODC mm. to uh, many others. Mm. Uh, 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 together, but always restricted mm. to what we are responsible uh, for and where we have an authority mm. and not trying uh, to be a, 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 a world government. We are not superior mm. to the UN Security Council. And mm. uh, uh, this uh, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have to acknowledge. And, uh, uh, and, but in this framework, uh, there we did many changes in, uh, in, uh, in the last uh, uh, couple of years, and we are in a constant dialogue uh, how to ever improve uh, there in, in this direction. Can I, can Thank I come you. Yes, answer? quickly, because we're running a little To follow on from, from President Bach's thought. By, by the way, I've been on the UN Security Council, and our performance was so low. <laughs> <laughs> so weak. <laughs> so, um, when you say that we're not superior, I'm not sure about that. I, um, <laughs> don't, don't put me in trouble now. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's, it's really a fascinating subject, this, because both the IOC and the UN, in one way, it's aspirational. No, it's, it, 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 it strives for an ideal, an ideal in terms of the relationships between states and between human beings. And what, and you raised the fascinating point of when the world doesn't reflect that ideal and we have a, a job to help it reflect that ideal, 
you know, to what extent can we sort of lean and exert and persuade? And um, and you're you're absolutely right. You have a sort of that sort of you sense that there are limits. And after all, neither the IOC nor the UN is a sovereign body. Uh, it doesn't have sovereign powers. These are intergovernmental sort of organisms. Um, and it's how we can encourage through dialogue and through uh, leaning that we get a better performance. But it, it does happen. I mean, we, we um, and I'm looking here at my notes and uh, told by, this is this came from our moderator. I shouldn't disclose that. And she's also, <laughs> <laughs> I've just thrown you under a bus. <laughs> but she, the, she didn't give me any notes. Huh? <laughs> you can have what, what, about, what about fair <laughs> competition unfair, here? That's, that. that's right. That's right. We should suspend the meeting now <laughs> if I get into real trouble. <laughs> no. Um, mm. But that uh, through the MSC, through the, uh, the mega sport um, platform, events platform, we have had concrete results ending the International Basketball Federation's ban on uh, female Muslim basketball players from wearing a discreet hijab, establishment of grievance mechanisms from, uh, for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And so, and so things are possible. Um, and I think it's the, the the, the need for us to strive to maintain the ideals, the rights, the human rights of all peoples, the universality of it, um, is, is why our work is so fascinating and why it will always be ongoing. No, and I, I'm just um, on the idea that we can abandon law and we will, I, I don't think it will come any time soon. <laughs> so, <laughs> just well, what a pity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, and I I do take the point as well on the on the limitations, and I think that that in the discussions also with with companies, if I go just take the head on um, of of the work for business and human rights, that what the guiding principles on business and human rights offers is in fact some boundaries as well. I mean, it's it's a broad uh, space yeah. in terms of responsibility, but it's not an indefinite space. Yeah. And I think that that's why um, many sports organizations as well have, have expressed an interest in engaging, using that as a framework to define um, and, and set boundaries so it's not sort of um, uh, endless. Yes, no. I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious that we started late uh, because of the, um, uh, the little drama we had down in room 26. But I do want to leave a little bit of time for, for questions. So uh, if anyone um, of the participants have uh, comments or questions to either of our uh, uh, participants. Yes, Milun. Thanks very much, Lynn, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Milun Kotari. I'm a human rights scholar activist, formerly special rapporteur on adequate housing. Um, I, I was just thinking uh, while listening to uh, the High Commissioner and uh, President Buck that, uh, in, in, in a sense, both the UDHR and the Olympic Charter um, are lofty ideals that you know we are all striving to meet. Um, and in my experience working on, on different Olympics, uh, I want to point out one uh, egregious human rights violation that continues to happen, uh, which is forced evictions. This is a displacement of people from their homes and lands uh, because of the building of stadiums, infrastructure. Uh, we've had a long legacy of you know, thousands of people being displaced uh, in, in Seoul, in Beijing, uh, in Rio recently, uh, of, of the favelas, the poor communities, uh, in Sochi, in the Winter Olympics. Uh, we have information that even in the forthcoming um, 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo, um, homeless people around the main stadium have been displaced. Uh, there's a public housing uh, unit which housed elderly people has been, uh, elderly people have been displaced. And I wanted to ask, um, President Bach, whether this is an issue, obviously there are global standards, UN evictions guidelines and so on, um, which, need to, which need to be part of um, you know, respect for the bidding criteria. But when these kinds of violations happen, is there, what is the role of the IOC? Uh, is there some, I mean, the global evictions guidelines, for example, call for an eviction impact assessment that has to be done before uh, the events. Um, is that something you are considering? Because if we, if we think of uh, the legacy that l these games leave behind, uh, 
there is often a very, very negative legacy, and there's tremendous amount of literature on that. So I just wanted to, uh, not to put you on the spot, but just to say that uh, this is, I, I hope this is an issue of concern to the IOC. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank, thank you for, uh, for, for this uh, question. Uh, in fact, I uh, do not want uh, to, to enter now into uh, details there we could uh, uh, argue and also continue maybe bilaterally, uh, but uh, uh, what uh, happened, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in uh, Rio and uh, what uh, kind of uh, new housing uh, there was offered to, uh, to, to the communities and uh, that uh, uh, there, in fact, uh, uh, many in, in the country were very happy uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the, new, uh, the new offers. What we are doing there uh, to uh, uh, to have uh, certain standards uh, respected is uh, there, uh, first of all, when it comes uh, to our uh, evaluation of the, the, the candidatures, uh, then, uh, of course, there already uh, uh, questions are asked whether the projects uh, need uh, any kind of expropriation. Hmm. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the first part. If this is the case, uh, then uh, we're insisting uh, that uh, uh, the laws applicable there in the in the in the country uh, uh, that uh, there are uh, uh, fully uh, respected, yeah. and this leads uh, to uh, uh, to to uh, even positive uh, results. Uh, uh, we had uh, the one I was referring in 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 uh, in, in Rio, uh, where it worked very well for a, a great number of uh, of uh, people. It worked uh, there also in uh, in uh, Sochi, uh, for instance, where there was a, a whole new community uh, being built, and. Uh, uh, our uh, chair of uh, the coordination commission uh, there at, uh, at the time, uh, he uh, was considered by this community to be a kind of patron uh, for them uh, because uh, during every visit uh, there upcoming to the games, you know, he was, uh, he was asking about the progress, he was visiting the site, he was receiving people, having a dialogue uh, with them. So in order to make uh, sure that uh, these uh, applicable standards uh, are, are being met. Um, I have, um, we'll take a couple of, of questions. So I have the delegation of Japan and then uh, Tim from ITUC. Anyone else would like to have the floor and then Gigi. So the delegation of Japan. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate that what you have said, to have said. Uh, it's really uh, thought-provoking and very fascinating uh, discussion on the you know, human rights and sports. And uh, I'm really you know impressed by the you know, very interesting uh, discussion. And as the host country of the Tokyo 2020 Games, that uh, we are pleased to say that uh, we have also introduced uh, Tokyo 2020 Games Sustainability Plan. And in that, we prioritize the human rights and inclusiveness. Also, Tokyo 2020 is also a very good path for the process of formulating our national action plan on business and human rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the one thing I like to ask is that you, know, uh, you didn't mention the Paralympics games, that you know, Japan is also a host of a Paralympics game 2020. And uh, if you have any comments on the Paralympics games, uh, I would really like to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, I should mention I was in Japan, I had the great pleasure of being in Japan two weeks ago, and there was a lot of talk about uh, Tokyo 2020 and all the different issues that we're discussing that, that uh, arose, uh, are arising out of these, the preparation for the Games. Uh, Tim. Okay. Should I answer or you uh, want? I think we'll take a few okay. questions. Uh, this is, for this, you need intelligent people that uh, <laughs> remember. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my question is, um, I, I think the motivation of the International Trade Union Confederation in this area is very clear. It's our support and defence of uh, the rights of workers and indeed uh, human rights more generally. 
Um, we're living in, a, in an increasingly fragmented and fractured world, and we've heard, uh, particularly from President Buck, some, Buck, some references to the, uh, the kind of convening potential of sport uh, across what might other be, otherwise be political, even conflictual fault lines. Um, and at the same time, uh, much to our pleasure uh, of our organisation, we now see the institution of human rights as a central element uh, in sports governance, the delivery of events and so on, uh, coming into shape. My question uh, for both the High Commissioner and for President Bach is, do those two things collide? The human rights uh, commitments and the, the kind of convening potential in what is an increasingly fragmented and, and fractured world. Do you pre prefer to answer now? We've got three more speakers on the list. So do you, would you, do you prefer to respond to these last two speakers now? Or, I mean, it's up to you. Mm. What do you think? Should we... I'm just a little bit conscious of okay. time as okay. well. Okay, let, shall we take these two questions? Yeah. Then? and then we'll take the yeah. next three in a okay. round. Okay. Um, it's an excellent question, uh, Tim. I mean, the, I think the president made clear that uh, athletes have to, in one way, be kept separate from the, um, the ephemeral changes in the relationships between governments and states, the feuding, the sulking, the diatribes or otherwise. Um, and uh, that it's not the athletes that are uh, often the ones who are, who are creating these senses of, of crises. And you can sort of, you can see that, the need, the, the need to separate that. In terms of the, the issues that were raised earlier, the matters of you know, forced evictions, labor rights, uh, you know, uh, supply chain, sort of contamination in terms of violations of, uh, of the sourcing of materials and whatever it may be in the construction of facilities, the maintenance and support of the facilities. That is all I think that can be resolved because like any good governance, whether it's in a, a company, a firm, an NGO, and high commissioner's office, you know, um, good governance is actually quite hard, but it, it's not impossible to achieve. And uh, so it's, it should be, you know, uh, where these problems exist, uh, they need to be focused on and they need to be sort of eased out of the system. And uh, as the president was saying, in every endeavor, uh, we will see those who may try and cut corners or cheat or uh, you know, whatever it may be. And we have to be vigilant enough to make sure that it's not at the expense of others. And, and it, should need, it has no space in, in any part of human experience, uh, least of all in, in, uh, in sporting uh, uh, experiences, which aim to combine and to reinforce the human spirit. Uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right, first of all, that our, our world is, is more fragmented uh, than, at least I can remember, even more fragmented than in the Cold, uh, Cold War. Uh, that. Uh, and I, I, I had uh, there uh, a couple of conversations uh, with the uh, with the High Commissioner and just also before this uh, this uh, meeting. It is the values uh, we are standing for. Uh, they are exactly the contrary to what to what we see uh, in in many areas of of today's world. You know, the the, uh, uh, the value of solidarity, mm. uh, for instance, it's not really the trend of the time, mm. Mm, to say it politely. Mm. Uh, respect mm. is not the trend of the time, it's not mm. the zeitgeist mm. at, 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 at this moment. So mm. yes, uh, uh, there, uh, uh, for us, uh, the, the, the challenges in this fragmented world are becoming bigger, with a few to, uh, uh, to really uh, get uh, this uh, power of sport to unify people uh, to, to, to come to fruit. At the same time, we have to realize that uh, when, when doing this, 
there are the challenges uh, you're, you're men uh, mentioning. Uh, there are the threats to our values coming from, uh, from, uh, from the other side. Mm. So uh, the solution, I think, uh, must be to uh, address these uh, challenges without jeopardizing uh, the overall mission of, of, bringing, of bringing people uh, together. Yeah. That means, uh, if you want to, to have it more, more, more concrete, you know, that, that means uh, not uh, to make athletes mm. responsible yeah. uh, for uh, uh, the, 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 the mistakes or the fraud or... Uh, the embezzlement or uh, the corruption of, of others. Uh, so uh, to address all these uh, challenges where they happen, but uh, uh, to, to try to keep this uh, unifying uh, power of sport alive because it is so, so threatened in our, in, in, in our world. And uh, I think there we all agree that we, we may need this uh, sometimes last resort uh, there in, in this fragmented world, uh, maybe more than in, in the past uh, yeah. decades. Yeah. And the Paralympics? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the, the Paralympics, uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, for uh, every candidate to host the Olympic Games, uh, it is obligatory also to organize uh, the Paralympic Games. Otherwise, uh, it could not. It could not happen. Uh, uh, so uh, we uh, tell uh, every candidate: uh, if you want to organize the games, you must also organize the, the, the Paralympic uh, Games. Mm. The uh, uh, then the, uh, the, the the sporting side of uh, the uh, organization is in the hands of. Uh, the International Paralympic uh, Committee, which is uh, autonomous uh, from uh, uh, the, the IOC, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, we have uh, one budget. There is only one Olympic budget, and this includes uh, uh, both uh, the, uh, uh, the Olympic Games and the Paralympics, uh, but it is uh, funded only by the IOC. Hmm. So uh, the IOC uh, will uh, contribute to the budget of uh, Tokyo 2020 uh, with a value of about uh, 1.6 billion uh, uh, US dollars uh, to finance hmm. the organization of the Olympic Games and to finance uh, uh, the, the organization of uh, uh, the Paralympic uh, mm -hmm. Games. Furthermore, uh, just a, a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago, uh, uh, on the occasion of the Paralympic Winter Games in, uh, in Sochi, in, uh, in Pyeongchang, uh, I have signed an, an agreement uh, with the president of uh, the International Paralympic uh, Committee uh, until the year 2032, uh, which uh, ensures uh, the Paralympic uh, uh, Committee these uh, conditions and offers uh, the International Paralympic uh, Committee uh, even uh, further uh, support uh, uh, for their administration in their marketing uh, with regard uh, to uh, uh, TV rights and TV production uh, and uh, so on, so to have uh, the bond uh, even even closer. Mm. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, the International Paralympic Committee uh, there uh, had uh, to uh, uh, acknowledge and co to, to commit uh, to uh, the reforms uh, we undertook in, in the IOC mm. recently, our Olympic Agenda uh, 2020, uh, to make uh, the games uh, more sustainable and more uh, feasible, uh, so uh, they then, you know, can in turn not uh, put uh, more requests 
on an organizing uh, uh, committee mm. after the host city contract uh, has been uh, signed. Mm. Mm. So there they have to follow the IOC policy that uh, everything what uh, might have to be changed after signing the host city contract can only uh, happen in an agreement by, uh, by, all, uh, by all parties. Can I ask a naive question? Yeah, we uh, can I say we are really running short of time, and we have three speakers who asked for the floor. So if your naive Sorry, question with, with can the be very brief, of, uh, um, just extremely naive. The, is it impossible to conceive of of one games, uh, President Park, where you just you have you know both sets of games combined into one? So you'll have different venues where it, uh, you, in one venue you'll have okay. persons with disabilities who are participating in another venue where it's not the case, and, or is it just the costs of it are just so prohibitive it would be impossible to conceive of it? Or is it, uh, is it possible to imagine it one uh, day? It is, uh, first of all, not something that the International Paralympic Committee wants. Okay. For, uh, for, for, different, uh, for different reasons, uh, mm. the, because, uh, you know, uh, 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 there, uh, the attention of the public is not unlimited. Mm. Uh, mm. So if in these 17 days uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. you overproduce, mm. uh, then uh, this uh, uh, will be a, a big channel, mm. a big challenge for the for the Paralympics uh, mm. athletes. But on the other hand, it uh, would also uh, not be not be possible cost-wise mm. and. Uh, you know where we are. We are already now at the limits uh, of uh, uh, what uh, uh, there we we can uh, we can have in yeah. the Olympic Games with regard to the the number of athletes. Uh, uh, take uh, take yeah. the Olympic Village. If uh, you have to add uh, to the eleven thousand athletes uh, yeah. and uh, four thousand uh, officials yeah. we have in the Olympic Village, if yeah. you would have to to add. Another yeah. seven, eight thousand, mm. uh, yeah. and then there I'm not even speaking of the sports facilities. Yeah. Uh, so it, it would be a, yeah. a, a, a yeah. huge, yeah. a huge challenge, and would yeah. be somehow contradictory, you know, to uh, our overall uh, reforms to make uh, the, the games more sustainable and more feasible. Yeah. Okay, I have Gigi, so if you can just introduce yourself and then the delegate uh, from Brazil and from Uganda, and then we'll close with some final reflections. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. So Lene asked for personal reflection and uh, suggestions. So I will try to do this very quickly. Uh, my name is Gigi Alford and I coordinate the Sport and Rights Alliance and I'm also the head of sport and human rights at the World Players Association. Uh, I, I really hope that this event does help raise awareness for the 70th anniversary for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I can say that um, at the World Players Association, we're also no strangers to trying to leverage the attention that sport brings uh, to um, advancing good causes. At last week's uh, Uni Global Union World Congress, we showed the uh, video produced by FIF Pro of uh, the you know, major soccer players, sorry, football players, uh, <laughs> at, you know, at speaking to the value that the player unions have brought to them. And of course, this is something we hope that uh, you know, children, that schools everywhere will show to demonstrate to children that their sports heroes have you know, also benefited from the value of uh, collective bargaining, collective action. Um, for us, uh, you know, I really wanted to thank the High Commissioner for mentioning uh, youth and for reminding us that you know, sport is no different uh, when it comes to upholding uh, standards of protections for um, affected groups. And uh, similar to uh, my, my colleague here on adequate housing, uh, my, my suggestion uh, really is speaking to the child athletes that we're hearing you know, more and more are suffering from uh, some of those uh, sides of sport that might that have stepped over into excesses, um, you know, some, um, uh, you know, at the level of strain, some of at the level of abuse, and there are, you know, a number of standards, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, that really speak to upholding uh, protections for for these children, safeguarding them, but also ensuring their well-being. Um, there, there is. 
I think in this case, um, child athletes that are looking to the world of sport for the excellence that we've spoken about in this session today, and they've seen a very different side. And this is uh, the time in a world uh, I think that we've noted is suffering from a lot of chaos and confusion uh, for sport to step into this uh, vacuum of leadership. Um, and also just a reminder that sport must try harder uh, at this time to maintain its social license because of the number of crumbling institutions around. So we must do more. Uh, and I think the discussion today will definitely help carry us forward. So my suggestion definitely is to examine those standards to integrate them uh, at a fundamental level so that we can and maintain um, the power of sport that we've spoken to. Thank you very much, Gigi. Um, I give the floor to the delegation of Brazil. We felt, even our mission here, we felt as if we were under attack. And to be very frank, it appeared at some points that there was a concerted media campaign to raise uh, issues, uh, find uh, faults, and, and criticize. Uh, I'm not saying that we're above criticism, uh, on the contrary. Uh, but we always see, and that's how we approach the issue, that sports has a, is a positive opportunity to promote human rights. Uh, and uh, what I fear is that uh, in this, uh, say, scenario of, of excessive scrutiny, perhaps, and over criticism, this might discourage uh, other countries uh, from uh, hosting uh, mega sporting events, especially developing countries, which already have uh, uh, major challenges on their own. Uh, and this is what I would like to hear from you both, uh, the perspective uh, looking ahead. How can we avoid this, this uh, overt criticism and try to promote sports and human rights uh, with uh, engaging civil society together with states which may host uh, mega sporting events? Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to the delegation of Uganda. Thank you, moderator. And I would like to express my appreciation for the presentation made by the two distinguished uh, speakers, His Excellency the Commissioner, uh, the, the High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights and uh, the President of the Olympic Committee. Uh, I have a, a brief question on the question or, or the issue of universality. I found it very interesting that uh, when we are talking about universal human rights, we are talking about universal sports, and both of them have got rules. Some of them, of course, are uh, high, some rules are higher than the other, so they become probably even laws or regulations. Now, how can we use the principle of universality of one in order to make us operationalize the other? Here, what I mean is, uh, for example, if you take in sports, uh, we have been talking about, say, Paralympics, for example, the rules require a certain type of people to participate in that kind of sport. Now, you do not have to force or to coerce somebody who does not qualify to participate in Paralympics. Now, in human rights, there are certain norms and uh, practices. The rules say this kind of category, they practice this kind of behavior. Then another category, they practice another category. But what I see in the universality of the human rights is that everybody is to practice certain norms or certain rules which even their condition may not allow them to fit within those categories. So how can we use universality of sports to make us operationalize universality of human rights more profitably and more understandably? Thank you. Thank you. Could I invite you to give some, some brief reflections on the questions and then also some final reflections that you may want to convey. So, President Buck, if you want to... Uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, therefore, bringing up the point of uh, safeguarding uh, athletes uh, from, from uh, harassment and, uh, and abuse. Uh, this is, in, in, in fact, a, a very critical uh, topic on which uh, the, the IOC is, uh, is uh, working already for, uh, for a number of uh, years. 
uh, we have established guidelines in this uh, respect and uh, last uh, uh, year uh, we had a, a working group uh, chaired by Prince Faisal of uh, uh, Jordan uh, issuing uh, toolkits uh, for uh, any National Olympic Committee, uh, Federation, uh, clubs, uh, coaches uh, uh, there to uh, to address uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, there uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, a lot to do, but uh, not only in sports. Uh, there, we think we, we really have to look at this in also in in a, in a broader in a broader context, um, because. Uh, uh, you know the the, the, the these uh, young kids uh, do not only or these childs uh, do not only uh, have a sport as their environment. There are many influential uh, 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 factors, and uh, there I think uh, sport uh, has to team up uh, with uh, uh, others uh, with a. With uh, schools, uh, in sometimes even uh, kindergartens, and uh, uh, what uh, I, I don't want to become there too, too, uh, let's say personal or uh, you know too, too, too detailed. But uh, um, when I was uh, president of the German uh, National Olympic Committee, uh, we we were facing uh, uh, such a, a problem all over Germany in in. in churches, uh, in uh, schools, uh, uh, but what I still, you know, really uh, yeah, makes me emotional today is that uh, the worst and the most cases uh, there are, are uh, happening in families. Mm, yeah. And, and, and to, to imagine this, you know, is, is something yeah. which uh, really uh, makes me makes me furious makes me uh, losing my 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 belief in 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 humankind but we we cannot we cannot ignore this and sport alone cannot solve uh, uh there this uh, this yeah. issue so uh, there we have uh, we have to work uh, together to have an atmosphere around this uh, uh, this uh, child so that if something is happening in sport that uh, this uh, child is daring to speak with uh, the, the parents, or is daring mm -hmm. to speak uh, with the teacher, or is mm -hmm. uh, is uh, uh, having the the, the opportunity mm, uh, uh, to to address uh, the, the issue, to, to 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 speak up, so that mm, then uh, we, we can uh, we can take uh, all all the necessary uh, measures, because mm -hmm. in 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 this area, it's all about prevention. There, every case uh, is is one too much and can destroy a whole human life hmm, mm. forever. Mm. Uh, this is why there uh, it's prevention, 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 and there in 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 cooperation. Mm. Uh, when it comes to to a collective bargaining, uh, uh, you know that there uh, I think we have different areas of uh, responsibilities. Uh, this is uh, uh, clearly a, a, a human right for for workers, and in this uh, in this respect, uh, for uh, for athletes uh, who are uh, employed uh, by uh, their, their professional clubs or or, or, or leagues. Uh, but uh, there is a very different uh, situation uh, with uh, regard to. Uh, uh, let's say in this case the Olympic athletes to make it uh, easier. Uh, there is an overlapping, but uh, f uh, for whom uh, uh, sport is is more uh, about the social uh, activity, uh, who have uh, uh, their own employment outside uh, sport or are supported by 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 their governments, uh, and so on and, and so on. So there is a. Uh, we have uh, to see the different the different categories, and we cannot speak about the athletes uh, as uh, as, uh, as such. Uh, you're you know 100 percent right with the examples you're giving uh, there with uh, FIF Pro and uh, 
and uh, football uh, football players. Uh, but it's already, if you take the other side, it's already different, let's say, in tennis, uh, where the athletes are more entrepreneurs, mm. uh, or uh, then, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 a wrestler, uh, mm. or to uh, uh, make it uh, even more easy, a fencer, mm. uh, uh, where uh, that the situation is, is very much different and has to be addressed uh, differently. Uh, with uh, regard uh, to uh, Brazil, uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, if uh, I would know a recipe uh, how to avoid over-criticism to hosts of Olympic Games uh, or the IOC, uh, I would be very happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm afraid uh, that uh, there uh, it needs some more reflection. And if you have an idea, uh, please, uh, my telephone line is always, uh, is always open. Uh, to uh, the delegation of uh, uh, Uganda, uh, you are touching a, a very important uh, a point uh, that uh, means uh, the uh, equality of chances uh, there, which uh, uh, we have realized uh, with uh, regard to the participation in uh, the, the Olympic Games, but uh, which uh, we have not uh, fully realized uh, with uh, regard uh, to, 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 to the athletes, uh, their, their training and uh, their opportunities to, to prepare themselves. We're addressing this in two different ways. With regard to the participation, if uh, a National Olympic Committee uh, does not have an athlete being qualified on the sports field, on the, on the field of play, does not meet the Olympic uh, standards which we have to establish in order to limit the number of athletes, mm. then we are inviting six athletes mm. from this National Olympic uh, Committee to participate nevertheless. So that uh, every National Olympic Committee can and has the obligation to participate in, uh, in, in, the, in the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. With regard uh, to making, uh, to improve the conditions uh, for, for these athletes in their, uh, in their countries, we have a program which is called uh, Olympic uh, Solidarity. Uh, with which uh, we spend in, 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 in four years. Uh, this is about you know, the, the period uh, of the Olympic Games, the, the Olympiad, about uh, half a billion uh, US dollars uh, to support uh, their uh, athletes and the National Olympic uh, uh, Committees, in particular in those uh, countries uh, uh, who are, uh, in, in sporting terms, are uh, developing. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are, uh, for instance, uh, um, scholarships uh, for, for athletes uh, which allow them uh, either to train better at home mm -hmm. or uh, to move to a continental training center or uh, to go uh, to a university uh, uh, abroad mm -hmm. where they have uh, better, uh, better conditions and uh, nevertheless to represent their National Olympic uh, Committee uh, then, then afterwards, uh, these are programs for uh, better coaches. Uh, these are uh, 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 programs for better administrators, and uh, so on, and, and, and so on. And uh, there, I can tell you that uh, I just had uh, the president of uh, the National Olympic Committee of uh, Uganda uh, in uh, Lausanne, in our headquarters, uh, last week. Uh, that uh, your National Olympic Committee knows uh, uh, very well to access these, uh, these uh, programs and is doing a, a great job there for the athletes, but also uh, on the area of uh, conclusion, uh, inclusion, uh, where uh, uh, they are, uh, together with uh, UNHCR are providing uh, sports programs in a refugee camp in, uh, in uh, Uganda. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they're uh, also giving testimony to the social responsibility of, uh, of sport in this respect. Thank you very much. Um, some final reflections from the High Commissioner. No, that very quickly. I, I, on the issue of, of uh, in particular, children and what they go through, I, 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 having been the parent of uh, two competitive fencers who competed all over the world, essentially training five days a week and then uh, competing over the weekends, it is true that to succeed, and, it's, and this is the sort of sad part of it, that uh, if pushed by coaches and you train harder, it will show in results. And you're absolutely right, from my own experience, where we often see almost, I mean, real abuse, it's often from the families. It comes from within a family. They want to see the child either succeed in the sport of choice or in academic life. And what they're prepared to do to the child is uh, some, it's really anywhere, anyone's guess because my impression is that it shows results and then you abide by it. But the long-term consequences on that human being is something which is best borne out by the athlete themselves. And one remembers uh, Andre Agassi when he published his memoirs claiming, I mean, basically he said that his father refused to send him to school and kept him on the tennis court, you know, seven, seven hours a day. And it produced uh, a magnificent athlete, but uh, someone who had many years of difficulties coping with what they were deprived of. Um, and I think uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that that uh, the IOC is taking interest. I mean, this is the responsibility of clubs in many, many parts of the world and federations to, to understand what is happening. Um, but I've seen it myself, how often the coaches understand the limits, but will push the, the athlete hard, especially if they're talented. But it's the families that make uh, unreasonable expectations somehow, and you can see the, these problems. Now, on Brazil's uh, point about um, excessive scrutiny, good governance is hard. Everything that you try strive to do that that is really of a top performance is hard. And I think holding oneself to a high standard and having uh, outside scrutiny, even if it's bruising and and at times it it can offset what the overall attempt is, is nevertheless in, in the best interests of the of the state concerned and. And ultimately, many of these problems f do have a solution. It just requires, uh, it requires uh, added attention. And um, on Uganda, I think you answered the question very well. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we started half an hour late and we ended half an hour late, so I guess we're sort of more or less even. I do apologize for those who had made um, other plans, um, but I would like to invite you to join me in giving our two distinguished speakers an applause and say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.